this is a presentation that I do at a lot of our trainings. And what we'll really focus on is really the installation practices. Um, how do we install a side stream unit and some of the basin cleaning principles? Um, if the installation is not good, then a lot of times uh, the owner's perception or possibly the contractor's perception of the filtration skid isn't ideal. So we wanna make sure we get at least the basic installation principles um, laid out for you. And we're gonna to attempt to do this. Normally I have whiteboards and lots of interaction with you folks, um, but today I'm gonna to try and do it as, as close to a verbal presentation as possible. Um, we'll have a lot of pictorial slides and um, we'll go ahead and get started. So my hope is that you guys will be able to um, size and apply packages like we noted in a side stream and basin cleaning application. Um, we cut out the full stream just for time purposes. And in the HVAC applications, typically full streams only use really more protecting plate and frames, or if they have a really, really dirty environment and their chillers are plugging up regularly. Um, so this little chart just gives you a, a scope of some of the products. And again, you're not going to see any E-series equipment on here. But note that E-series, um, the high efficiency separators and systems can be applied the same way as we're talking about um, with the standard HTX, HTH, and the TBX and TCX product line. So we're gonna focus on that for the purposes of just this presentation. So if you see here, we can see that with um, the settleable solids, which is your sand, silt, grit, dirt, dirt and rust, we talked about how all that entered into the system um, the previous presentation. Um, we're going to start off with going on with a just a separator by itself. So this is not going to include any pumps or um, uh, control panels of the sort. So we'll have some pictorials as we go along here. So this particular one actually is showing, we'll start with the systems. So if you notice, the system pump is here. And as we go up to the system, we want to tap into the bottom of the pipe. And the reason why we want to do that is we want gravity to be our friend as much as possible. So let's say, for example, if this main condenser water pipe is 18 inches, we'd like to have, if possible, an 18 inch T here. The further the distance is for that dirt that it has to go, then the more difficult it is to get past our suction line and downstream, which you can see that which goes directly to your system, the system flow. So what we would do is we'd have an 18 inch T. In this case, we'd reduce, this is just again, hypothetical, reduce from 18 down to eight inch. And that eight inch pipe would come all the way down into our pump suction. One thing I will point out is that we do not have strainers on the standard side stream systems. On the E-series packages, we do include those, but on the standard ones, we don't. Those typically are gonna be pre-strained at your system pumps, either at the suction side of those pumps or the discharge side. We have to have a small booster pump based on whatever flow we pick for the side stream application. So let's say in this case, um, we have just hypothetically a thousand gallons a minute going through your main system flow, and we pick 10%, then our package that's doing the filtration would be about a hundred gallons a minute. So some of the things that you notice or don't notice in this particular app, um, picture is that we do have an isolation valve at the suction side and an isolation valve at the discharge side. And the purpose for doing that is if they ever need to, let's say, maintain pump seals, or if they had to do something uh, internally with the separator, which is, is rare, um, we can at least isolate it from the main system. That way they're not having to drain or shut down their whole system flow. So isolation valves are critical. We boost the pump to whatever the losses are coming through the pipe, through the separator, and then back into the system. One thing I will note, the distance between your inlet to our pump and the discharge going back into the pipe, which can be on the top, the bottom, or the side, that, 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 that doesn't matter, but it does matter on the suction side coming off the bottom. So the distance between those two, we'd like to see a minimum of three feet, even further if possible. The closer you bring this to here, the more disturbance you get. It becomes very turbulent when you try and suck from a position here and return very close to it. So we wanna keep that distance as, as um, at least three feet minimum. The other thing I'll note is that on a side stream package, as we're trying to flow 100 gallons a minute, 
and we're going from a pressurized line back into a pressurized line, we're gonna be higher than what this line is so we can make sure we get it back in. And number two, that pump, and this is where it's difficult to, to without showing you directly, for those of you that do understand pump curves, most of our sizing is, is at the best efficiency point of the pump itself. As we try and flow more water um, without restricting or without that pump knowing where it's supposed to flow, there's potential that these pumps will overload. They'll come all the way right. If you can see my cursor, I'm kind of faking it here. All the way right on the pump curve. And when that happens, there's the potential for the motor to overload. The thermal settings inside the panel will trip and then the motor will stop. So what we suggest doing is with that isolation valve is just restrict it some. And what we wanna do is create back pressure and to set the differential between the inlet of the separator and the outlet of the separator somewhere between three to 12 pounds of differential. Sometimes if that pump tries to flow too much water, you're gonna get some vibration on the system. As you close that valve, and sometimes it needs to be as much as halfway, as you close that valve, it'll restrict the amount of flow and we'll set the actual um, differential between the inlet and outlet between that three and 12 pounds of differential. So side streams a fairly simple installation. Um, we try and avoid pipes, that are a, a greater distance than say 10 to 30 feet. We try to minimize elbows um, and again, one, one valve and some reducers possibly. We wanna minimize the amount of friction loss coming into our system. And the outlet, again, just straight into that pipe if possible. That's a pretty straightforward um, installation with a full package system that has a booster pump on it. So the next couple slides, you're gonna notice that this does, does not have a pump and it does not have a control panel. So this is one method to actually install a side stream separator. So again, same principles that we talked about with a big T, it comes into the inlet of the separator. And I will note that it's always, it always needs to be installed on the discharge side of those main pumps. You never wanna put it on the suction side. Same, same goes for the previous system. It's always on the discharge side of that pump. We have a lot of requests to put this on the suction side of these pumps, and they do not operate to design flows. We end up fighting a large system pump with our small little booster pump. So just take note of that. So in this case, the, the sizing principles are the same, anywhere between five to 25% of this total system flow. We break it off, bring it into the inlet of the separator. We set the differential to that three to 12 pounds, and typically it's gonna be based on the actual flow we're trying to do. And that outlet needs to go to a lower pressure zone, which is typically back to pump suction or back to um, a pit possibly. Maybe this is an in-ground sump or possibly they're taking this flow back to the cooling towers. It just depends on what they wanna do in the field. Um, but you need to make sure that the pump that they're using for their system, this pump is oversized to accommodate the flows that the separator's doing. And that's because we bypass that water from whatever heat exchangers they're using downstream. A lot of times engineers won't take that into consideration. So we need to make sure that we, that we put in the design flow of that separator back into that pump. Energy isn't for free. So we have to get that flow and pressure from somewhere and it's gonna be the main system pump. Third is another, um, Principle of installation for side stream. I don't necessarily recommend it um, just because these valves become very big and very expensive. But with that valve, you would size it to the same size pipe that the system pipe is that's going um, from your main pump to the heat exchangers. And that valve would, would create a false differential across there. So it'll force the water into the separator, remove the solid from the liquid, and then we plummet back into that same pipe. So again, it's just another method to be able to apply a side stream filter. Sizing is the same, anywhere from five to 15, or I'm sorry, five to 25%. And typically that's based upon how dirty your environment is. So now we'll get into the tower clean basin stuff is which is where we wanna spend most of our time with this presentation. There's a lot of tricks to the trade, so to speak. So we'll get into some of the sizing, which a lot of you guys may be familiar with, but we always wanna repeat that we're looking at one GPM of filter pump flow rate for every square foot of your basin. So if you remember anything through this whole presentation, this is the one thing that I encourage you guys to write down and keep in mind. 
So the other thing that we get a lot of questions about is the nozzles themselves. You know, what to use and why to use them and when to use them. So the blue nozzles, which you can see here, are our older style hydro boosters that flow 10 gallons a minute at 20 PSI. Now that's critical because the manufacturers, and I'll mention all three of the majors, sorry if you guys don't have the specific brand tower that I'm mentioning, but it's the three majors, um, Evapco, Marley, and Baltimore Oil. They utilize the yellow and sometimes, um, I'm sorry, sometimes the yellow and most of the time the blue nozzles. And that's gonna be the higher flow systems that require 20 PSI to operate at 10 gallons a minute. So make sure that when you're making selections with your E-Series packages, if you're working with Baltimore Coil, Evapco, or Marley, that you use the right nozzle. Yellow with the old style TC systems, I'm sorry, blue, or yellow with the E-Series packages. And the difference is they require only 10 PSI with 10 gallons a minute of flow. So it's critical that you make sure that these match whatever system you're selecting, uh, the LACO system you're selecting. And each of the factories should work with you uh, to be able to get the yellow or blue nozzles installed if you're getting the factory installed piping. The brass spray nozzles, um, Marley, I know, uses the same flow and size nozzle, but they're plastic. Um, Evapco, I believe, uses the actual brass. And um, BAC, I don't think that they're using any of the quarter inch or the brass or plastic spray nozzles. Um, I may be corrected if any of you guys um, realize or know that they are, but from what I recall, they're using either the blue hydro booster or the yellow hydro booster. So again, it's primarily the color difference dictates between your E-series and your standard um, old TC series um, package systems. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, this is a good installation drawing, and if you guys don't have it, um, I don't, why don't you email me at the end of the presentation? I'll have my email up. And then what we'll do is we make sure, we'll make sure we get you these drawings. Um, they're, they're kind of, um, I'll call it, they're, they're rare to have. So I want to make sure they're in the presentation. So if you guys want to screenshot them, you can too. Um, but it shows basic installations. For those of you that have aftermarket groups, um, for example, I saw some of the mechanical product Southwest guys out of Phoenix. They do a lot of their own basin installations. And they'll utilize this type of drawing to show what's used with clips, um, especially with the clips, because um, it makes the install much easier. With the clips, all you have to do is drill a 9 16 hole, which you can see here, I'll zoom in on it, into the pipe itself. And then that clip goes right around the pipe. And then you have the adapters either on the hydro booster itself, or you can install the adapter into the clip. And then you have an extension pipe and then another adapter and then the hydro booster threads into that. Same with the quarter inch spray nozzles. Um, they're quarter inch, so they're gonna need to be reduced um, to fit into a three quarter inch adapter to work with three quarter inch pipe. And also the same with, with the vertical um, down in the depressed areas, which we'll get to in a minute to show you on the basins themselves. But you can install that clip on the bottom of the pipe and then let it extend down in the depressed areas of the sump. So your piping sits all um, above the depressed area, so you're not cluttering down below. And this just shows the adapter with, with the hydro booster going right into the clip. So if you look at the previous slide, you can kind of notice it here. You can buy just the hydro booster, which is a three quarter inch connection, or you can get it with the adapter, which allows that half inch connection to go right into the clips themselves. So a lot of people ask, what are the adapters for? Well, here you go. So that three quarter inch nozzle without the adapter will not thread into the clip. It's a different size um, threaded fitting. So hopefully that makes sense also. So again, if you'd like these drawings, just email me at the end of the presentation um, or sometime today or tomorrow, whenever you get to it, and I'll make sure that you're able to get this um, and I'll forward it over to you. So the next few slides I'm gonna go through show examples um, of different styles of cooling towers and what to look for when you're really doing the installations. So on our submittal drawings of the actual systems, a lot of people ask, why do you make the suction size so much bigger than what the actual inlet to the pump is or the strainer? And that's to reduce friction losses. If you look here, we note that it's a six inch suction. The cooling tower manufacturers typically provide four 
that's okay. You can increase the pipe size right there where that hole is to reduce friction loss coming into the pump. And I have a slide at the end of the presentation that will show you why we wanna make sure that the friction losses are low coming into our package systems. The discharge back to the cooling towers aren't as critical. Um, so if you have a four inch or a six inch, let's say off the, the system uh, package, the filtration package, that return to the cooling tower can be the exact size of what the actual separator outlet is. There's no need to increase that pipe size. Most of the headers inside the basins are gonna be two or two and a half inch. One thing I will note that they need to be two inch or one and a half inch if you're gonna use the clips that I showed on the previous slides. The clips only come in an inch and a half and a two inch pipe configuration. So just keep that in mind. Sorry. So this particular style of basin is, is for a, a BAC 3000 series or for the Marley NC series. They're very similar. Dimensions might be a little bit different, but what we do is we install the pipes up above on your upper decks below the fill on each side, each air inlet face. And then the depressed area, which is what I was talking about earlier, that pipe is suspended up above or just at the water level maximum. And those pipes draw and point down into the basin themselves. That way you don't have all that piping sitting down in this bottom area. It can get cluttered sometimes with the actual system outlets, which you know could be a 10, 12, 14, 16 inch outlet. So hopefully everybody can see that all right. And then at your air in nut faces, which you can picture your fill is right where I have the little handprint there. We wanna make sure at each air inlet face, we have the pipe moved up away from the wall. If you don't, what happens is you get a lot of debris and some potential algae growth on the top of that pipe. And then it's the most visible area to your customers. And we wanna make sure that those areas are clean, especially um, because you can just look right over the edge of the air inlet faces and you can see the dirt in those areas. So we have opposing nozzles that actually sweep along this wall to push it to the center. And what it'll do, this pipe sits about a half inch off the ground or off the basin floor and the dirt gets pushed into the flow of these nozzles on the above deck. It's a really important part when you're um, doing the air inlet faces to make sure that these, kept, that these are kept swept. So this is a style that BAC will use. And then Marley actually has nozzles that are on little extenders. I don't have an actual um, picture or diagram of it, but the extenders come out and it has the quarter inch nozzles that sweep this area. The point being is that they still sweep those air inlet faces. All right. So here's more of, um, I'll call it kind of a, a similar to a DeVapco um, 1500 series, where it has one upper deck and one lower area, and then also the DeVapco AT series. This happens to be an actual uh, DeVapco drawing that we're doing, and it's the same principle. In this case, um, the water levels on these upper decks are, are fairly shallow. So we, number one, we need to make sure that the water level is high enough to actually um, be higher than what the nozzle center line is. And we need about an inch or two of water above those nozzles. Otherwise, they will push air. And we all know that air does not work well with pump suction. Um, just another quick diagram. If you're not able to get the main header piping all the way around the basin, in this case, it sits outside of the basin itself. We have a valve at each entry point that strings into the basins, and it has a gauge also. And that's the balance, the flow going throughout the whole thing. So if you can't put the header all the way around the cooling tower itself, you can put the main header on the outside, which you can see here, and run your stringers to the inside. Um, one principle that we get asked a lot is how do you actually do multiple towers? In this case, if you're using one, one system package, like you see here, sweeping all three at the same time, those basins must be equalized. So I may have mentioned that in the presentation if any of you were on it um, a couple weeks ago, but make sure they're equalized. The other thing is sometimes they'll have one, two, or three, and one's a future. If that's the case, we can size this system to accommodate all three cells, and then they would just put in an overflow or a bypass that would normally go to that cell that's not existing, and that would just return back to one of the other cells that are existing. And that gives them the ability to have that system already installed and not have to have a whole nother system to do that last tower when it does get installed in the future. So that bypass, it could be anywhere from a, a one inch up to a three inch line, depending on the flow that's actually gonna go to that tower itself. 
Um, the other thing which I didn't include here just because of the nature of time, the switching valve setup, which we can alternate size one package for a single cell and then it'd go on a PLC and it would, it would switch zones and each cell would be a zone just like you do your regular sprinkler system. One other um, installation that comes up quite often is remote sumps. And I know and I'm, I'm conscious of the time here, we got a couple minutes, we're almost to the end here, is self-priming pumps are critical to use when you have a remote sump that's below or the water line is below the center line of a standard pump. Standard in suction pumps will not lift water. In this case, I show a six foot eight inch lift of water. You have to have either a vertical um, turbine pump or a self-priming pump. A lot of times we get packages installed in the field and they have a, a sump that's below the water level or package cooling towers for that matter and our package is sitting above the water level and they wonder why they won't flow water to the basin. Well, it's because you get air locked. That air sits between the top of the water and the inlet of our pump. So if that happens, a quick fix, and I'll call it, it's kind of a, a semi-fix, is that down at the bottom, wherever that pipe goes into from the pump suction, we can attach a foot valve. The caveat with that is each time um, or over time, that foot valve doesn't always hold water. So if they shut the system down for any given uh, amount of time, that water will drain back into the sump and they have to reprime or refill that pipe with water. So the foot valves will work initially, but over time they'll leak back into the sump and that line will still have air in it. So I encourage you folks, if you have remote sumps like this, that the water levels below our pump suction, that we look at self-priming pumps or vertical turbine pumps. And we can certainly help you guys size that as required. Uh, lastly, if you have large sumps, in this case, this one's 121 feet by 30 feet. Typically we see this in power industry, cogen plants, that type of um, hospitals, um, sometimes have large uh, remote sumps like this. We would end up splitting them up into, into smaller systems rather than doing one large system. And again, one GPM, per square foot for the filter pump flow rate. So in this case, we're flowing about 3000 GPM for the overall square footage of this particular basin. And then we would do the layouts to show um, the contractors general ideas of uh, installation and pipe size. So here's the picture I was talking about at the end of the day. When you have a pump that is not meeting its NPSHR or the net positive suction head requirement, you end up getting cavitation on that pump impeller. So this is the one thing we really want to try and avoid when it comes to um, basin cleaning. We do not want those pumps cavitating. It's extremely rare in side stream applications, um, but in basin cleaning, I see it fairly often. Um, I have a couple samples that I take, you know, for those of you that have seen our demo trailers, um, I keep a, a, an exploded, what I call it, impeller. It looks like a shotgun uh, completely blasted the surfaces and created holes in it. So this is what we're trying to avoid with uh, larger pipe sizes, making sure that the connection size on the cooling tower is large enough um, so that system can get a, a good adequate flow of water um, without starving those pumps. With that being said, I wanna be courteous to your guys' time. It's really difficult um, to get all the installation principles and ideals um, down to a half hour. So what we'll do is we'll have continuing presentations and webinars. We encourage you guys to join us um, when you can. And uh, we'll get into more depth with some of them and other, uh, and other topics also. Um, you can email us topics that maybe you guys want to hear and Kathy's updates that you guys are getting weekly. Let her know what you guys want to hear about too. And then we'll make sure that we cater to your needs. So with that being said, um, if you guys want that drawing that I said earlier, here's my email address. Um, we'll go ahead and end this um, webinar. We appreciate everybody attending. Um, and again, feel free to email me directly if you do have additional questions or um, if you want to take my phone number down, it's 559-269-1737. For those of, of you that are outside my territory, you're welcome to call me about this presentation, or you can contact your um, regional manager directly also if you have questions. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon, and stay safe.